to hit that record button now remember john your opinions do not reflect those of the special (laughs) operations command central atlantic anywhere socom is your opinions do not reflect what they're doing john welcome to the show man well thanks for that reminder i'm happy to be here i'm trying to think of any other disclaimers we should have john thank you for not making knives i don't end up buying another one (laughs) not yet not yet anyway and then Eric Eric Bishop is joining us as co-host today. So let's get going, guys. Let's talk. We're on a Protectors podcast, and we're here to talk about all things Marines. Specifically, Marsoc. <laughs> John, Marsoc, you know, I'm a, I'm a child in the 90s. I shouldn't say child in the 90s. My military career began in the 90s. The Marine Special Operations Command, everything was so much different in the 90s, the Cold War 90s. Everything changed 9-11, you know that. So yeah. you you're you were birthed in the Marines, let's just say that. And then you got into recon. This variable of MARSOC, where did this all come from? Yeah, that didn't exist for the, the preponderance of my career. So the the US Special Operations Command, you ch- kind of joined the the military about the same time that I did, uh, just just a little bit before. So in, uh, oh, I should know this, but I think it was April of 87 was when SOCOM was, was officially formed. And it was a outcome of the failed attempt to rescue the hostages in Iran. And they realized after, kind of after what was called the Eagle Claw or the, the Desert One debacle where you know, soldiers died, um, that there needed to be some unity of command when conducting special operations. And you know, it took it took a little bit of time and it took some congressional uh, kind of mandates. But eventually, the in 1987, the U.S. Special Operations Command opened its doors. And when it did, it in, invited the SEALs to, to be a part, the Green Berets to be a part, the Rangers, the U.S. Uh, Air Force Special Operations guys, the combat controllers and uh, and PGAs to be a part. And the Marine Corps was invited, but decided to opt out at, the, at that time. Um, and I didn't know about this, you know, for, for a little bit after, but it was, you know, they were formed in, like I said, I think April, I joined the Marine Corps in June of, uh, of 87. So just kind of missed, missed that. Um, but it took me a, another five years before I made it to, to force recon. And at the, the time that force recon was, uh, the, the Marine Corps special operations force and had been, you know, since the the fifties. Now, when you talk about force recon, I, in my, in my mind, I imagine reconnaissance, all reconnaissance, you know, throw the ruck on your back, throw a million pounds on your back gear and everything you could possibly imagine and hump towards your location, observe, reflect, call in whatever you need to do. But Marsoc, it seems to me, turned into more of like a direct, I mean, when I, when I read up on you about going in Iraq, mm-hmm. turned into more of like a direct action type force. Yes. Uh, so we've always, uh, there's, there's always within the Marine Corps, there's been a reconnaissance battalion and they, they serve as the, the eyes and ears essentially of the battalion commander that they support. The force recon has always been re answered to the, the force commander. So whoever the, the kind of the highest commander on the field was in, uh, after nine 11, when I found myself in Afghanistan, that was general Mattis. And we were, Reporting to General Mattis, kind of taking direction from General Mattis um, to observe and report and interdict, you know, enemy activity. Um, so Force Recon has always had the secondary mission of direct action. So early on, when we uh, kind of assumed that mission, about the same time that Special Operations Command was was forming, you know, it was. Uh, in extremist hostage rescue, you know, if if the big boys couldn't make it to town, then we were the guys who would who would be called on to do that. We were obviously sea based with the Marine Expeditionary Unit, so our deployments were on ship, and we were usually a pretty quick trip away from any hotspot. 
And that's that's what happened with 9-11. I was sitting in a, a bar in Darwin, Australia, you know, when the, you know, we saw the the first tower get hit. Um, knew that, that hey, finish your beer because we're going to go jump on the boat and, and make our way to Afghanistan. Yeah, it's crazy, 9-11. I was in, like, I was at, when in the 90s, I was enlisted as artillery. And then I branched infantry later on. So I was actually at infantry officer basic course at Benning. I nine eleven. We were supposed to do our um, our mount training that week, and really, it did change. You know, we went from like you know the the peacetime army, you know, essentially peacetime, to all of a sudden, hey, everybody's going to war. You're eventually going to go to war, and it, it just changed. Now, I'd imagine with Marsoc and with Recon and and all of that, it really, I mean, it just went on. It didn't just change; it evolved. I mean, we're talking decades and decades here of, of just evolving into a war fighting machine but in order to get to that evolution you had to actually start yeah. now your book tough rugged bastards you you talk about how the marsoc started and how they needed these tough rugged bastards to go out there and do the job yeah the uh so like i said i was one of the the first marines in afghanistan in in 2001 mm -hmm. And, you know, we were there and we were actually in Pakistan in October in in uh, Afghanistan in November. Um, as that was happening back in the States, the Secretary of Defense was was, you know, kind of looking at the big picture of, of this war that was was no longer on the horizon. It was here. Right. And uh, he rightfully said, hey, you know, this is going to be uh, the war that you know, special operations needs to have a big play in. And so he pretty quickly directed that all of the special operations components increase in size. So, hey, make more SEALs, make more Green Berets, make more Rangers. And this time, you know, the Marine Corps was told, hey, you're not allowed to opt out. Um, and the, the Marine Corps has always had, and I, you know, I'm a Marine, always be a Marine. I love the Marine Corps. But the Marine Corps has always had a somewhat of a, a tough relationship with any special operations unit. All right. That started with, uh, you know, World War II with the Marine Raiders, the Raiders uh, then they mm -hmm. existed for two years and they were, they were disbanded. Um, you know, Force Recon was, was formed. And then uh, you know, the unit that I spent most of my time in first Force Recon was disbanded after Vietnam and wasn't, wasn't reformed until uh, uh, 1987. So there was, there's always been a reluctance to have someone in the Marine Corps that views themselves as better than any other Marines. You know, the Marine Corps looks at itself as a special operations force and, and rightfully so. All right. Uh, but that's uh, when you're the guy who's trying to work your way up to the, the tip of the spear, that's a little bit, um, uh, you know, it can be disconcerting right you're like hey i'm i'm just trying to do do a job that that you know that obviously there's a need for um so this time the marine corps was told you're going to participate in in the special operations command and still they kind of push back uh for a good while and u.s special operations command push back as well the army kind of enjoys like a, a 75 percent ownership of uh, u.s socom as uh, they're the army right they're huge so the seals form you know I don't, I forget the statistics, but uh, somewhere in the 20, 25 percent, um, the Air Force, and that's largely because they within special operations, they have aircraft maintainers and, and things like that. So they're a pretty significant chunk. But the Army has a, a greater than 50 percent share. So when we came along, we're talking about initially the initial uh, tough, you know, unit that Tough Rugged Bastards was, was kind of based on. There were less than 100 of us. So we, we really weren't a threat to anybody, but, uh, but still there was, there was pushback from the army, pushback from the Navy, pushback from the Marine Corps. And, uh, we were told, Hey, you know, in spite of all that kind of make it happen. It's like, Hey, here's a scraps guys. You, you do what you gotta <laughs> do. You're going to be part of this machine, but you know, and we'll let you in on the party, but it's just you nobody wants your, you. Yeah. yeah. You got to earn your way. Yeah. And when you talk about ego, you know, I picked up a word ego somewhere around there. I don't know if I said it, or you said it or anything, but, when you throw in the Marines and the Navy SEALs and the Army, you know, Air Force, hey, we can get along with them anywhere because they have the best show. But <laughs> listen, when you are when you put all these egos together, and especially you're such a small footprint, 
you really got to have strong leadership to back you. Mm -hmm. And I'd imagine in the beginning, you really had to have the strongest leaders because this is the, this is the birth of MARSOC. So what yeah. was, what were the, what was leadership's like? Leadership. Like that? Yeah. They, the Marine Corps, despite the fact that they weren't excited for the whole enterprise, right. They, you know, we're not going to fail. So they picked the, best guy that they could to head this whole thing. And he was, his name was Colonel Robert Coates. He had been, been a Marine, you know, kind of just a post Vietnam days, uh, you know, hadn't served in Vietnam, but uh, spent time with, you know, working for the agency, spent time down in South America, you know, working against the Contras and, uh, or, you know, um, during that thing uh, in El Salvador, uh, just and he had been I was fortunate that he had been my boss for, you know, over a number of units, which, if you know, in the military is very, very rare that you have the same boss across mm -hmm. multiple uh, multiple units. So he was the exact right guy to pick um, for it. And he, you know, when he asked me, you know, if I wanted to serve as a team leader uh, in the unit, then. Then yeah, there was it was kind of a stupid question, right? Um, the and he brought me into his office, and that was you know where the the title of the book came from. And it was I I, I swear to God I thought this at the time. He was like, hey, daily, you know my expectations, excellence, you know nothing less than that. And uh, you're allowed to pick you know out of the Marine Corps who you want for your team. Uh, just the only stipulation is that they're tough, rugged bastards with strong backs and hard feet. And that was verbatim the words that came out of his mouth. And he, he said a lot of other stuff and like threatened me if I didn't perform. But when I walked out, I was like, you know, one day I'm going to write a freaking book. And the title of that book is going to be Tough Rugged Bastards. So it was there was a little bit of a fight with the publisher. They were like, yeah, we don't know. You know, bastards might throw some people off. And um, like, really, that's you know probably not the worst, you know, word that uh, that people have heard. But uh <laughs> Yeah, I was I was adamant. I'm like, that's kind of a deal breaker for me. You know, this mm -hmm. is this book uh, has been a long, long, long time. I mean, over 20 years kind of in the in the making. And mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, one thing about, you know, I Go wanted to, I did want to talk about the book because you joined the Marines in 1987. You know, we, we have very limited conflicts between 87 and 2001. You know, you have Granada, you have Desert Storm, Desert Shield, you have some Somalia action with the Marines. And then you're in then you're doing direct action missions in Iraq. I mean, that must, it, you know, going from the reconnaissance to the train up, to heading over there, the pucker factor, even as a Marine, because, you know, you always have to have that stoic, you know, hey, you know, everything is good, I'm good to go. But that first initial pucker factor of being, whether it's Afghanistan or Iraq, that must have been pretty high. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I had been in, before we got to Afghanistan, about 14 years. So, you know, a pretty significant, I mean, much longer than most people, you know, by, by a factor of, of several that most people spend in the military. So, and I had uh, really, I had missed out on, on everything else. All right. I was in um, overseas, well, overseas working at embassies when the Gulf war happened, right. And in, in 90, I had was supposed to go to Somalia and the, the Marine Corps, made a, a decision to, to switch, you know, my unit out with some other unit. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd really had just kind of missed out on, on every opportunity of everything that you, you join the Marine Corps to do. Right. And uh, I was, I had really started to think that, that I'm like a bad luck, you know, penny or whatever, or, or good luck. I guess it depends totally on which way you want to look at it. But from my perspective, for somebody who had, had the opportunity over those intervening 14 years to have been trained as a sniper, been trained as a, you know, you know, arguably among the best, you know, in the Marine Corps and force recon, uh, jump out of airplanes, dive, you know, and, you know, in the harbors, uh, train for close quarter battle and hostage rescue and all of these things. I had, you know, done a lot of training, but never had the opportunity to, to employ, and it'd be it until uh, Afghanistan in, in late 2001. 
And even, even minutes kind of before the first firefight that I got into, I was kind of joking about the fact that I was bad luck. You know, I'm like, you know, you know, go ahead and go relax. You know, nothing's going to happen. And then, uh, you know, two minutes later, we're kind of in a gun battle for our lives um, on a cold road, you know, outside of Kandahar. But uh, yeah, it is, you know, I think, I think you don't, you know, you don't join the Marine Corps for the college, right? You join the Marine Corps um, because you want to be a Marine. You want to test yourself. And, uh, yeah, that was, I had almost given up on the fact until, uh, until then. Given up on a fact. And that's the thing. I think a lot of civilian world doesn't realize that you, when you join, and I was looking at some of your other podcasts and stuff, when you join to be an 11 series and or three, one, one, you get into these types of units, you want to go to war. Mm-hmm. You want to fight. You want to protect the homeland. You want to protect your brothers and sisters. You want to do what you got to do. And you don't want to just train all the time. Training is great. It's great. It's great. But then you actually want to actually see if it works. Mm-hmm. You want to test yeah. yourself. And that's that's it, I think, more than anything. I mean, there's there's you know, the perception that people want to go kill somebody. You know, I don't, you know, that never really was the thing for me, but you, you, you've done all of this stuff to, to hopefully mold yourself into the type of person who will think well, perform well, act well, do all of the things that you, you need to do in combat. And so there's absolutely the desire to, to have that opportunity. And it's, it's intoxicating really. I mean, you know, when the adrenaline starts pumping and, and things are going and, you know, if you are, if you trained well, and if you know, your leaders did a good job of building you, you know, you uh, you perform as you should, and it's a magnificent thing to watch. You know, in Afghanistan, I had the the opportunity, and I, I talk about it kind of at length in the book, but uh, to see the guys, you know, standing beside me, guys that I had I had. You know, had some role in training as their platoon sergeant over uh, you know a number of years, and watch them just do exactly what they should be doing in the the situation in a very complex situation. It's nighttime. There's fire. There's people shooting at it, and and just watching them like, man, this is uh, this is it would be hard to explain, and it is hard to explain to somebody who hasn't been there. Did the off factor, and not not off factor in. I guess for all those years of training and then to actually go and implement it, did the, did you, does, was the transition a lot easier than maybe you might've expected or was it just natural that everyone just, like you said, just did what they were supposed to do? It, it was. Uh, and, and like I said, we're, you know, in the force recon unit, we were really, really well trained. I mean, we had, you know, just rehearsed and repeated and, and done things so many times there's a saying that uh, one I got from Colonel Coates. He was, said, uh, you don't practice until you get it right. You practice until you can't get it wrong. And that was really the mentality that I took into to training these guys. And they came with their own, you know, they, you know, they weren't new when I got them. They were guys who were seasoned. Um, so there's, yeah, there's almost a, uh, a little bit of a, a letdown. You're like, man, I thought that this would be harder. Right. I mean, you know, I thought that uh, it would it would freak me out a little bit more. I thought it would be a little more stressed. Um, but when you're like, hey, this is there's a saying that the the Romans had that their their drills were bloodless battles and their battles were bloody drills. Right. And if you just you practice something enough, it becomes second nature. Mm-hmm. And there's you really start to to uh, notice the I mean, I'm, so much of it is mental. Right. You know, just that you've done mental rehearsals, that you understand what happens kind of in the brain and in the body under conditions of stress. Cortisol gets released, you know, epinephrine, norepinephrine. You get this surge of, of chemicals and there's a pretty predictable series of, of events that happen. Um, you know, the and a lot of it was things that I'd read about, things I've been told about. You know, uh, the FBI does the probably the best job of of cataloging agent involved shootings and mm-hmm. so the the idea that that there's a thing called auditory exclusion where you just you can't hear anything you know gunshots which are really really loud don't sound very loud uh there's a perceptual narrowing so your you your focus shifts down to just the the bad guy in front of you um you start to lose uh 
you know, blood shunting. So your body is trying to go into fight or flight mode. So it's trying to put all of the blood into the big muscles, right? So you can run away, right? For the flight, um, which can make some, some things fine motor skills challenging. So there's all of these things going on and it could be overwhelming if you weren't, you know, aware of it. And fortunately we had spent a lot of time with, with people who had been in, you know, from LAPD SWAT guys to, you know, FBI agents to other, uh, you know, military folks, um, you know, we would routinely bring in, you know, Vietnam veterans to, from Force Recon to, to talk to us about things. So we had done everything imaginable to prepare ourselves you know, other than have somebody shoot at us. So it was, it's, it's good to know that all that, that taxpayer money, you know, and time and, and everything was, was well spent. Taxpayer money. That's because <laughs> I'm thinking of the thousands and thousands of bullets you guys go through the fire and train and everything, but also the blanks, the simulations, the simunitions, the 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 quantity of training you do. And that's one thing I've always wondered about the special operations community. It's a lot different than you know being an enlisted 13 Bravo guy. I spent most of the time in a motor pool cleaning up oil spots. Infantry, just paperwork. A lot of you know, as far as an officer and stuff like that. But when you get into the special operations, what is? We're not talking like okay, we're talking about a train up. What is your train up like? What's the week like? Uh, it wake we up in would, the morning, run, run twenty miles. <laughs> <laughs> we would, uh, you know, train in blocks. I mean, I, I think most people it makes sense, right? So you'd have a, you might spend a week doing practicing medical training, you know, you'd spend a week or two doing communications training. So just making sure that everybody knows the radios and that's the sort of thing that gets, gets boring. You know, people aren't terribly excited about it. I really hated, we would usually start the day at our medical training by giving, you know, somebody else an IV and getting an IV, um, a valuable skill, but I really, I don't like needles. So I was always, uh, um, but you know, then when you get out to the, the, the whole idea is that everything is is a spiral approach to learning, which has really kind of become the the big educational buzzword now. But uh, you know, the scaffold that hey, you you know, start with some medical training, start with communications training. Now you're using the communications to call for a medevac while you're working on the guy. Now you're out shooting and you're you know having simulated casualties, and you not only have to call in the medevac, but you have to call in supporting arms, so artillery that come in or or gunships, and you just you know, progressively build, you know, over time until you're, you're performing, you know, you have guys uh, performing everything that would happen in combat minus the, the getting shot back at part. And even that is simulated quite a bit. So, um, you know, as we progress closer to our deployment, our weeks were, you know, quite often we would just stay out on the range and, you know, up in the morning, you know, shoot all day or sleep all day, shoot all night. Um, it was, uh, and, and on occasion shoot all day, then shoot all night. It just, uh, you know, really depended, but it was, it was consistently hard training. And that was you know, a lesson that I'd learned very early, um, in, in my career. And when, you know, one that I absolutely, you know, carried on from, uh, you know, from Carl Coates and from other, you know, leaders that I had that, that just pushed the fact that, the thing that always scared me as a leader is, you know, having to come back and, you know, tell a wife or tell a child or whatever that, Hey, your husband isn't, isn't coming back because I didn't do a good job enough of mm -hmm. preparing him. Um, and that, that, you know, just literally scared the shit out of me. When you talk about training, it, it's evolved. It has absolutely evolved. You know, when we talk about the eighties and nineties, we were fighting the cold war. We were fighting a big, large scale, um, in the army, we call them Krasnovians. That was our opponent, <laughs> you know, the 1990s. Training evolved so much that you're, you know, now you have all the Gucci gear in the world you want. You're not running around with, you know, scraps and everything else you need. But who's conducting the training? How do they keep up to date? I've always wondered that, too. Yes, your yeah. unit can know exactly what they're doing, but who is bringing in a training and making sure that they're up to date? Now that's that's a great question. And that's really started to, you know, post 9-11 started to to change, you know, because mm -hmm. in the 
in all those those days, um, you either you know you just trained kind of in house, or you went to uh, and we used to go to the army. You know, train with the army out at uh, like Fort Polk, uh, the joint uh, JRTC, or the uh, up in California they have the the big training center in uh, oh, NTC. NTC, yeah. where you're fighting the, I don't know if they're called the Krasnovians, but yeah, they're in, in Soviet tanks and, and vehicles, you know, fighting a, a big force on force war. You know, we would, for that, we would like parachute in or move in and, and observe and report. And it was great training. But post 9 11, there was a recognition that, hey, there are people who have done this. You know, there are people who have, uh, particularly, you know, Somalia era guys, you know, some, uh, uh, higher level, you know, guys who had, who had worked, um, or, you know, either FBI types and, and special agents and things that were brought in that had expertise in certain areas. So it really, you know, within special operations, there was a level of funding that wasn't, it's not available in the big army or the big Marine Corps. So, you know, we would bring in, uh, like top Ipsic shooters, um, you know, Todd Jarrett and just guys who were the top of their game at shooting. And they had never, you know, heard a shot fired in anger, but they knew how to shoot. So you use that for what it's worth. Then you get some guys who had been in Somalia with, uh, you know, the Black Hawk Down, you know, guys to come out. And, and a lot of them had, had started training opportunities. And so that that really started growing post 9-11. People that had something to offer, um, making a good bit of money, but also, uh, you know, doing their best to make sure that mm-hmm. you know, that, that soldiers, sailors and airmen uh, had the skills uh, to, to meet the challenge. And that, that really continued, you know, people started branching out into, to vehicle training into, you know, all sorts of, you know, explosive training people with particular expertise. And there was no shortage, you know, early in uh, you know, post nine 11 of money to, you know, to throw at that at training. So it was good, you know, absolutely great to get uh, trained by the best, you know, I mean the best in the world at a particular skill. Was it difficult to come home, you know, now and tell those stories? Cause for so long, um, I'm sure as part of your training or as part of your instruction, you're basically told to shut up, not tell people where you're going, what you're doing, who's training you. And then to then put it in a book form years later, was that a hard mental block to get over or was it even cathartic to be able to then be at a point where you could share that? Yeah, it was both. Um, it was, you know, ab- absolutely. The Marine Corps prides itself and special operations prides itself on being quite professional. So being a, a Marine in special operations, you're kind of double, <laughs> double tapped on the, the fact you're that really they, quiet. <laughs> you're supposed to be, you're supposed to be humble. Um, and it's, it's hard because there's, there's absolutely a level of humility in the, and the guys that I, I feel are kind of at the, the higher levels. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but you're also, you know, there's a part of you that's like kind of really proud of, of uh, you know, the opportunities that you've had and the things you've had the, the ability to do. So it was, I didn't start writing this for really almost 20 years after the, the fact. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's absolutely a large part of it. That's, that's cathartic. Um, one of the things I, I think I wasn't prepared for, I had read when uh, one of the schools that that I went to early on was SEER, Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. Mm-hmm. And it really had formed on, you know, taking POWs from Korea and Vietnam and, and taking their lessons and how do you, you know, live in that environment. And one of the things that always struck me as interesting with those guys when you would talk to them was that after a long time in, in captivity, you realize that everything you've ever seen or experienced or learned is still in your brain somewhere, right? You just have to think long and hard enough and have nothing to do for weeks at a time. And there was one of, uh, one of the guys that they brought in to talk to us was had recreated, you know, every classroom that he had been in from first grade, I guess, on, you know, where everybody sat. And it just, over time, he's like, Oh, that was Linda and Billy and Jimmy and Tommy. And, and he, uh, but it's it's funny when you actually, you know, and I'm like, man, my memory is shot. All right. I've been exposed to a lot of blast. You know, I don't know if I blame that. But uh, when you when you sit down and really start thinking back, you know, things start to 
open, you know, it's kind of like floodgates start to open and memories come back. And, and I wasn't entirely prepared for, for, for all of the, the memories that came back, but, uh, you know, ultimately it was, it was absolutely a, a beneficial experience. Putting pen to paper. And like you said, the quiet professional, listen, I love Navy SEALs are great. They do their things, but there's a million Navy SEAL books out there. It's tough to find some solid Marine books, yeah. ton of army books. But I remember, you know, before the age of the internet, I'm going to the Wayback Machine here. Before you could YouTube everything, and all we had was books. You know, mm -hmm. like me trying to figure out what service I wanted to go into is always like, you know, look at the Vietnam era, how many books were out there. Mm -hmm. I still think, yeah, podcasts are great. YouTube is great, but there is nothing like a book to get the information out there and get the the visualization flowing than you would get from like an audio, you know, from anything like that. Mm -hmm. So when you're putting pen and paper, uh, you know, using the old term pen and paper, and obviously we're using typewriters here, but when you first sit down where you're like, man, I've been a Marine, where did this, this writer come from? Where's the John Daly writing aspect of this whole variable come in? Yeah. Let me, like you, I grew up loving books, you know, my first, uh, and I kind of lived out in the middle of nowhere. So, uh, I didn't have a lot of friends to, to play with, right? but uh, my dad had a big, you know, just this bookshelf that it seemed a lot bigger than it is now, but just filled with, uh, you know, the Hardy boys and adventures, Tarzan, Zane Gray, just all of these uh, books of, of kind of badassery. Right. And, um, you know, I loved reading them and, and, you know, when you, love reading kind of the next logical step is that you, you know, you want to write your own stories or you want to do things that are, are interesting enough for somebody to write stories about. So I, you know, as a kid, I liked writing stories and always just in my head was like, yeah, I'll, sure. I'll, I'll probably wind up writing books someday. Um, the Marine Corps kind of does, you know, doesn't encourage the, the uh, artistic side of, of things that much. <laughs> Um, I did write a few, you know, articles just you know, about training and about things like that, that, that made it into Marine Corps publications. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I, after I retired, I had uh, the, the GI Bill was, you know, a great, uh, you know, phenomenal, probably like the best benefit that, that the military offers, right? The opportunity to go to college. And I had used the last couple of years that I was in to get a, a bachelor's degree in and and that was a surprise to anybody that knew me right because i was the, the kid least likely to to, to ever uh, engage in the higher education but at the time i thought that uh homeland security studies was kind of the the thing right i was going to be a, a security consultant and make a bunch of money um so i was able to use the tuition assistance that the marine corps has to get that without using any of my gi bill so when i retired i was like hey you know after a couple of years, I'm like, man, I really, I've got this. I'm not going to let it go away. You know, I'm going to use this, this benefit. So I got, uh, looked into a master's degree in, in, uh, literature basically. And as in liberal studies, but it primarily centered on literature. And that really got me into reading again, reading more than, uh, you know, the newspaper. And, uh, in that we had to do some writing. And luckily, one of the professors just, you know, then that was when I wrote the the first story that really became this book. Uh, one of the professors was just like, hey, there's something here. You know, you, you've got a little bit of talent. You know, maybe you should consider uh, another master's degree in writing. And I'm like, uh, you know, what? I'll I still have some GI Bill left. So I'll I'll apply to the, the Master of Fine Arts uh, creative writing program. Give it a shot. And it was uh, so the University of North Carolina in Wilmington has one of the top programs. And and I was unaware of this, but they I mean, they take very few people each year. And I don't know if they needed more veterans or if, if I was local or what, what, the, what, what it was. But uh, I was very surprised when they, they told me that I had been accepted to that program. And that was I've said this, you know, countless times that uh, that was scarier, you know, walking into my first classroom trying to pass myself off as a writer than walking, you know, being shot at, you know, by, by far, it was, it was a scary, scary situation, but, uh, you know, dealing with 
I mean, the only being the only military guy in a in a writing program of of incredibly talented you know, mm -hmm. writers, all of them with with backgrounds actually that knew how to use punctuation and spell things properly. Um, that, that wasn't me. So it was. Uh, I learned a lot, and and they were very kind, and you know, taught me a lot. And it was uh, that really kind of gave me the the kickstart that I needed to to uh, attempt to write a book. Yeah, the uh, I could see. I you spent a career training to get really good at what you're doing, and then the the, the vulnerability of going out of your element and putting yourself in a situation where. I mean, when you're writing and when you're in that that position, it's it's all on you. And if it's something you're not comfortable with, not familiar with, could absolutely see how that would be more stressful than almost any situation you've been put in before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was I had been trained so well for being shot at. So that was, yeah. you know, kind of, um, you know, <clears throat> but I also the benefit was that I had been brought up and trained that, you know, if you decide you're going to do something, you you do it. You know, it doesn't doesn't matter that you are are completely ill qualified for it. Um, so you know, and over time you you learn. And I I learned uh, a you know a, a lesson that I learned as a leader early on is that you know take help where it's offered. Mm -hmm. Right? Don't think that you know everything. You know, there go to the person that knows and and uh, and learn from them. And yeah. the one uh, like benefit that I had was uh, something that I'd learned, you know, being a guy who'd become, you know, arguably successful in special operations as a, you know, a mildly talented, you know, kind of general athlete, you know, mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, you, the thing you can always do is work harder than, than anybody else. And if, as long as you, you know, refuse to fail that, uh, at least that's what, that's what worked for me. Mm-hmm. You know, you've expanded beyond just writing, going to class and writing a book and pulling it all together. You actually have sub stacks. And I always tell people, Mike, sub stack is just such a great area to do it. And one of the sub stacks you have is about rucking, but not just rucking. I mean, that's kind of like <laughs> the metaphor of it. Rucking is like my go-to. You know, that's my go clear my head. I throw the ruck on my back. I still do it. To, I'm gonna, Actually, when we get off tonight, I'm going to go ruck a few miles. Because nice. I just, you need to get out there and clear your head. You need something. You can't be stuck behind a screen. You can't just go to the gym and jump on a treadmill. I mean, yeah, you can go for a run, but listen, I'm not running. I'm 51 years old. I'm, my days <laughs> are running. Or my knees aren't going to take it. But you do have this stuff. You know, you have two sub stacks. One is Walking Point with John Daly. And everybody want to repeat that again. I say again, Walking Point with John Daly, and that's a sub stack. And the other one is about rucking. You know, ruck the fuck up. We're allowed to swear on here. But one of, your, cool. one of the things you had on here was this. I loved it. When you load up a ruck and put it on your back, your shoulders will hurt. If you move long enough, your feet will hurt. Your calves will scream and your lower back will ache. That's supposed to happen. If you do it long enough, it starts to hurt less. There are two reasons for this. You're getting stronger and building muscle, but you're also learning to embrace the pain, mm -hmm. to make friends with it, mm -hmm. to realize that it won't kill you. And that's the greatest thing about rucking is you're learning different lessons. That's a life lesson, everybody. That's that's almost yeah. like, hey, you know what? Rucking is going to hurt your body while it builds it. But that same concept that goes with rucking is life lessons. Mm -hmm. So I love how you you have the ruck. And a lot of people don't understand what, what the ruck is. So let's talk about these sub stacks. And, you know. Sure. Um, I started. So I started it after the the book deal had happened and I was told and I didn't know this. I was absolutely a, a you know, naive in, in everything to do with writing, but uh, you know, it's, it's valuable if you have a email list of people that you can send things out to. And uh, so I looked around at, at the best way to do it. Substack was kind of growing and as a platform, it's great. It's, it's offers a, a absolutely free way for, anybody really to, to have a platform and have opinions and, and write. Um, so I started doing that and, you know, first with, with walking point, um, had a different name at the beginning, but, you know, trying to take the lessons. And I, I think there's, there's so much that I got out of my time in the Marine Corps, right? Leadership lessons, life lessons. And there's so much of the kind of the minutia of things that you learn in the Marine Corps that translate 
directly, if or somewhat metaphorically, into to life. And so I was like, hey, man, if I can, you know, use this as an opportunity to test some things out, you know, and and it's 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 grown. You know, it's uh, I've been kind of like <laughs> impressed with uh, with with how it's grown. People seem to like it. And I, I spent a couple of months writing about rucking and that that led to to, you know, a lot of people. Uh, interested in uh, rucking has grown as a. I mean, I think it was listed by like the New York Times as the the exercise of the year for 2024, mm-hmm. right? The the company Go Ruck has been a huge part of that. Uh, this guy Michael Easter has a great book called The Comfort Crisis that uh, do is also responsible for that. So I um, said, hey, let's absolutely, you know, rucking is this metaphor for for life, you know, a metaphor for building mental toughness, but it's also just putting a pack on your back and going is probably, you know, I'm um, about to hit 55 and, and I've spent, you know, post Marine Corps career really got into running long distance, like hundred mile races. And it beat me up a lot. So it's, it's almost uh, you know surprising that, you know, throwing 40 or 50 pounds on your back is less uh, of an impact than, than running, but mm-hmm. it, it is. Um, you know, and it's something that, that, you know, you can get out in the woods and, you know, use the, the weight on your back to survive and, and live, you know, camp, um, or you can just, just have weight, you know, sandbags or plates. And it's, it's something that anybody can do. And, you know, I can do it with somebody who's in far better shape than me. And I just, I can have less weight, you know, and they can have more or, or vice versa. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a, it's a phenomenal, um, exercise, and it's it's also you can't do it without learning something about yourself. So I've had the opportunity in you know since starting that for to to start, you know, the go rough people said, Hey, you want to come out and, and be one of our like cadre. Um, so I get, you know, the chance to do that. And it's it's really phenomenal to go out to an event, you know, meet some people that you you didn't know. Some may have been in the military, a lot of them not. And uh you know, people that are absolutely unconvinced that they're going to be able to make it through the the event that you put them through. And at mm-hmm. the end, to see that, you know, people come together, they help each other. They uh, so it's it's absolutely, you know, I'm a huge evangelist. Right. For put put weight on your back and and go out and walk. All right. It's there's very few things that you can do that are better for you than that. Throw the exempic away and uh, throw the ruck on the back. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I I only have one more question. I'm sure Eric probably has one more, but this is this can be pretty controversial here. Oh man, we don't we don't talk politics, but we do talk Gunny Highway. <laughs> Gunny Highway. What what? So what's the thoughts? What's the thoughts on Heartbreak Ridge? Oh, that that came out. I can't. I can't, I think it was about the time I was in boot camp. So I, I don't think that I had seen it. Uh, I'd have to check the, the exact date, but I th- I think I watched it after I got home from boot camp, and uh, that came out, or that may have been right before. But yeah, eighty six, uh, eighty six. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So it it did. I had seen that before, and when you know, when you see that, absolutely, as a as a young guy, that was, you know, that did not make me want to join the Marine Corps less. Right. That, uh, you know, the, the history of the story, the actual, you know, facts, you know, the facts in it are, are very sketchy, but the Marine Corps has always been willing to kind of play fast and loose with the truth, you know, as it, as it regards our history. Um, and I do, I talk about that in the book. There's some you know, kind of comical things that we've taken credit for that, that may or may not be, uh, 100% accurate, but, uh, yeah, to watch it now, it's it's absolutely a comical. But when I got to First Force Recon, I you know, came to find out that uh, a lot of the the extras in it, the Marines from the unit, were extras in that movie. So it was mm-hmm. you could kind of point to guys to be like, "Oh, wait a minute," you know. I, you know, they had obviously grown up a, a, a bit over the years. But uh, one of one of the the men who was in the movie, and he he plays the role of they're, they're doing repelling and he's kind of the Marine who's, who's preparing them to go off of the repel tower. Um, he, he wound up, he was our first Sergeant 
And he had really kind of gotten into the the whole acting thing and now owns a company that does. Uh, and he's worked with a number of movies with Clint Eastwood. So the Sands of Iwo Jima, the Flag of Our Fathers, you know, he was the, the military uh, liaison for those. So it, uh, I think I think his production company or his, his advisor company is called like First Force Productions. Right. So it ties back to that. But uh, yeah, that was a, a great movie. There were a few others. Um, yeah, Full Metal Jacket, obviously, was I didn't understand it as an anti-war movie, you know, <laughs> which I think it was meant to be. Um, you know, there's, you know, growing up watching, you know, books, obviously, I love books. But, you know, at that time, there were just so many, you know, Vietnam movies, mm -hmm. you know, Chuck Norris and Rambo and all of these things that were just fueled, fueled the absolute passion that I had to go uh, join the Marine Corps and, and find my way into a, a special operations unit. So where does John Daly go next? Are, are, are we going to delve into the fiction world or what's, what's next on the writing plate for you? That is a great question. I have, um, I, I have a part of my writing program that I went to, I have a novel. It, mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with the military. It's I, I've, I've come to realize it's not that great. Uh, it, it's it's got good bones, right? But it, it needs some work. I'm not sure that I'm up to that work. I, I I would love to take the things that I write about in the the Substack and expand on those. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was also you know, that's kind of been something going through my head over the the past couple of years that I've been doing this. Is that's that will probably be the next book, or at least the next thing I'll pitch as a book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's. I feel like there's a lot of, uh, you know, it's at this point in time, I, and I think it's something like less than 3% of the, you know, military age people are eligible to join because of fitness and because mm -hmm. of, and there's just, there's a lot of, of people I think that are looking for something that's, uh, that's, uh, you know, they're not finding. And I think there's, there's lessons, you know, even without joining the military, there's lessons that you can learn that, uh, I think haven't been taught to the degree that maybe they should be. So, so that's, that's kind of at least the, the thing that's sitting in the back of my head. Okay. Um, once I get through this, this whole book release thing, which is more strenuous than the actual writing I've come to find out. He's like, just, just shoot at me some more. I'm, I'm I, that I can handle, but this all this Easy. other stuff is, is yeah. difficult. So well, the beauty of it too, though, is you can do, you can go so many places. So, you know, Jason touched on your sub stack, um, you know, with the experience you have in real world and also the experience you have now with writing, you know, you can do short stories if you want. You could put together a novella. I mean, you could put together almost name what you want to do. And as long as you're willing to invest that time and you've obviously got the creative spark there, then, you know, kind of the and just the way the market is evolved over the years when it comes to publishing is you can go so many different routes to get your works out there yeah which is absolutely yeah and that's one of the things that i i do in my spare time all of my spare time when i'm not writing or being on podcast or rucking or or running or working is uh <laughs> where's this free time <laughs> yeah i don't know i don't know i get up very early but uh is is trying to encourage you know we kind of talked about it the cathartic yeah. the nature of it you know veterans mm -hmm. other veterans to write yep. one of the organizations i work for is is uh called the lethal minds journal and it's a great opportunity you know for veterans veterans um they're kind of exclusive to veterans but to tell their stories or you know have somebody you know work with somebody who's done a little bit of writing and you know help you craft it to a point where it could be it can be published you know or you can say hey you know what i don't want to publish it i want to mm -hmm. keep it for my kids but there's massive value in in and not just for veterans but uh, you know that's kind of where my experience lies and mm -hmm. you know putting getting the things out of your head and onto paper yeah and uh you know, it's, it's happening a lot more. You know, I think there's, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of people have stories to tell. There's a lot of people that want to learn from them. So mm -hmm. it's, there's not only it's cathartic, but it's, you know, there's also somebody that it's liable to, to help somebody that will yeah. benefit from it. Absolutely. That new mission, that's what it is. It's like, you're having a new mission. Like your new mission is like to be creative and there's such creative outlet there in the veteran community. Because one thing about being a veteran is you're always the, hurry up and wait. You're always in your mind. You're always in your mind. Somewhere along the line, you're going to be in your mind. 
And that's going to bring out the creativity in it or it's going to bring out a darkness with it. But I've seen so many more people getting creative. I mean, we, we were talking about it before we started the show, about knife making. Uh, yeah. you know, one of my, one of my mm-hmm. friends, Michael Broderick, he does acting lessons because he's an actor. He does acting lessons for veterans and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. There are so many ways that you can give back while also helping yourself. Hence, starting a podcast. Be creative in some way. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's yeah you know, the best advice. And uh, you know, so many. You know, I personally have, I think, in the past three or four months, know four, uh, you know, former Marines guys that I worked with or knew at least peripherally that uh, have killed themselves. And it's it's really you know this you know people are are getting out of the military where you have a very distinct mission, and then you know being you know, finding yourself without a purpose or thinking that, Hey, this thing is going to be the the thing that I'm going to, I'm going to get into and I'm going to get an MBA and I'm going to make a lot of money and that'll make me happier. But uh, the more I, I look at it, the more I talk to people, the more, you know, the people that you see that are happier people that have found some, some other way to be useful, right. To, to give back to somebody, right. And, and doing that to veterans makes sense, but you know, maybe it's, you know, writing something that for somebody else, maybe it's, you know, working in some other capacity, maybe it's being creative, but there's, there's absolutely too many people choosing a, you know, the permanent solution to a temporary problem. Mm-hmm. And I'd say that that reflects onto the civilian community as well. I mean, so yeah. many people in the civilian community are getting their head and they don't have that mission. They're chasing a dream that's more fiscally motivated than it is creatively motivated. More about that, you know, the next dollar sign, the next dollar sign when, yeah, you need money to live. But your primary function in life shouldn't be money. You can have 10 minutes here and there to be creative in some outlet mm-hmm. or just do something to keep your mind focused on not that dark matter. Yeah. No doubt. Well, John, I appreciate it. Everybody, the book is Tough Rugged Bastards. I should I, you know what? I got to really put their voice in there. Tough Rugged <laughs> Bastards, August 13th, 2024. John, Eric, I appreciate you both. Thanks. Thanks for having me on.